Greetings to all of the love and light of the one infinite creator. My name is Jonathan Tong and I am facilitator for the Seattle Law of One Facebook group. We can be found in the list of study groups found on the LNL research website shown on your screen. We can also be found in Facebook as the Seattle Law of One study group. We do meet on Zoom every Tuesday from 3.30 to 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. You don't have to live in Seattle to join the Facebook group or to join the Zoom sessions. Anyone who's interested and available is welcome to join. Also a good way to get announcements for future Zoom casts like this one. And today we are blessed again to have uh, Jim McCarty joining us for some informal conversation uh, and questions and answers about the Law of One. How are you doing today, Jim? Doing pretty well. Uh, in this part of Kentucky, everything looks pretty good. Seeing a little sunshine and still has some cool weather. Oh, good to hear. Yes, did hear uh, there was some flooding there recently in the eastern part of the state. Uh, can you fill in the uh, folks who are watching uh, on what happened there? Uh, I think I did it at the beginning, or was that not recorded? That was not recorded. <laughs> okay, <laughs> all right. Well, uh, starting Thursday night into Friday morning, there was some massive flooding in eastern Kentucky in the Appalachian Mountains. And the mountains drained a deluge of water down into the valleys where the various towns and individuals and their homes that were flooded out. So these people have had to take refuge in uh, uh, churches, uh, schools, uh, state park uh, uh, buildings, uh, anywhere they could find it. And uh, their first need, I think, which probably has been met by now is clean drinking water because all the water they had before was polluted. And there's a massive effort now to try to help people out uh, to uh, get donations out that way so that people can um, use them to find a place to live, to get some food, you know, the, the basic essentials of life. Uh, all of a sudden, you know, they've been taken away from so many people. So. Um, Right now, I don't know of any particular area. I think the Red Cross is always a good place to go to uh, donate to help people like that. Uh, you could just Google uh, how to help people in Eastern Kentucky, and then there are various organizations that are there that will uh, be glad to receive any kind of donations you'd like to make. Sounds good. We'll most definitely do that and uh, post some links to that in the uh, YouTube section or on the uh, Facebook pages as well. I uh, want to thank you for joining us again. I know your schedule is super busy. I know you've always got many things to do, so appreciate your uh, time joining us today. Uh, I did want to ask about uh, uh, recently, I believe that was two or three weeks ago, uh, our beloved friends, uh, cat friends, Dan the Lion and Chloe both passed into larger life. Am I remembering correctly? That was right. two uh, They were brother and sister. And uh, Chloe passed away on June 30th and Dandelion four days later on July 4th. And they both had end-stage renal failure. And um, it just got worse toward the end where uh, they weren't able to eat uh, or, or pee or just lost their energies. And, uh, you know, they uh, moved into larger life. And as uh, Ross said, pets are often a way that uh, third density entities result uh, from um, being loved so much and the devotion that's created between uh, the owner and the pet. And uh, that um, could well be what's happening with Dandelion and Chloe, I would imagine so. They were very loving souls. We had a great time together and they were quite devoted to me. We were together for about 16 and a half years, which is pretty much normal for the cat life. Um, over the 17 years that Carl and I had, or the 31 years, we had 17 cats. There, I got that straight. And um, Many do pass away uh, with kidney problems. It just seems the way that they, they go. So um, I miss Same. my dandelion and my Chloe, but I know they're in a better place and they're having lots of fun and maybe even becoming third density entities gonna enter into this uh, third density illusion. Right now, they don't have to deal with the veil of forgetting. So <laughs> they're in a good situation. <laughs> well, our heart goes out to you and the grieving process, I have very hard pretty much the same as human family. Oh yeah, yeah, the, I, I discovered that back when uh, Carla passed away uh, seven years ago, that uh, the grieving process is something that needs to be respected, that when the tears come, you, let, you need to let them come because eventually tears will heal. But if you try to you know, be brave and hold back the tears, you're delaying the process and it, uh, it's not a wise thing to do. So uh, I, I've learned that uh, a couple of times. 
Yeah, I appreciate your sharing that. I was wondering uh, from my own experience uh, uh, and with others, I know that grieving is an ongoing process and in, in yeah. many ways never ends. You just kind of learn to... to right. To, and I was wondering, did the loss of uh, Dandelion and Chloe kind of bring back memories of your grieving process when Carla passed? Oh, yeah, definitely. Uh, it was just the same process, you know, like uh, I think Helen Keller said it well. She said that uh, whoever we love deeply becomes part of us. And when they die, you know, there's part of us that seems to be gone to our perception. Really, they're not gone. You know, we are all one. We're all together in this journey of in a union with the one creator as we move through the various densities. But in the short run, whoever here in the veil of illusion, third density, it does seem like they're gone. So that's what we have to deal with. And it, it's a good thing to just um, let the tears come. And then eventually there seems to be a balancing process that goes on, at least it has been for me, that the uh, sense of personal loss that I feel is balanced by the sense of joy, knowing that they are in a better place and they're having a great time and that I help them get there. So, uh, you know, it's uh, all, all of life, as Ross said, is a balancing process. We deal with all the catalyst that comes our way uh, to process it so that we see that we are everything that we uh, experience. Uh, we are 360 degree beings. Every event, uh, good and bad, happy and sad, are all part of us. And we need to be able to accept all of that as part of us because that is the creator. Uh, as we become more and more aware of all of these facets of ourselves, it's like a uh, facets of a jewel of the creator and we're becoming that jewel. And, you know, uh, Ross suggested know yourself, accept yourself and become the creator. And the way you know yourself is to work with your daily catalyst, the things you have problems with people one way or another, communication or uh, whatever difficulty you've got, if you process that and see the, the, uh, the positive and the negative aspect and accept them both as part of you, that's part of the journey. That's why we're here. That's grist for the mill, like Baba Ram Das said. Indeed. Yeah, I really appreciate your sharing that. I think that's something that would be really helpful for anyone who's going through grieving process now or has in the, in the past <laughs> or will be in the future. Oh, yeah. It reminds me, I, I read, a, I saw a number of uh, sessions where there were comments about uh, the two cats playing or fighting with each other during the channeling sessions or anything like that. I, I'm talking more about the quotes yeah. than the Ross sessions. Do you have any funny stories to share about any time the cats are doing anything interesting during a channeling session? Uh, not really. I mean, usually those occurrences were when Carla was channeling Quo and the cats liked to come over and sit in their lap while she was channeling. Maybe two cats wanted to sit there and the second one had a little problem getting in there and there was a little scuffle maybe, but uh, other than that, nothing large. Uh, sometimes there was enough uh, significance that Quo would make a comment on the, the feline entities that were attempting to be part of the channeling process. Indeed. Yeah, so interesting. I do remember reading a session not too long ago where uh, Quo mentioned that cats have been part of our third density earth experience as protectors and guardians going all the way back to Egypt, all the way back to Atlantis. And even in the archetypical mind, I think it's in right. card number four, I think where's the, there's the figure of the cat. In the right. The cat that guards the path. Actually yeah. guards the seeker on the path. Yeah. Yeah, protector of those who are on the service to others path, if I remember. Right, right. Yeah, just fascinating to consider the, the long history of cats and people and such. Uh, hey, I had another question that I wanted to ask you about, something you read in the Camelot Journal recently, and I just wanted to encourage all the folks who are on the Zoom call right now. If you have any questions that you'd ask to like Jim, uh, like to ask Jim, feel free to put them in the chat window. Uh, otherwise, uh, Jim, I did notice that uh, uh, thanks to Gary and Austin, you've been doing some editing work on the uh, Living the Law of One 102 Outer Work and Living the Law of One 103 Inner Work books. Is that correct? Uh, they're editing just 102 right now. I'm also going back through 103 to try to expand some of the concepts and to make it uh, more easily uh, understood 
and share more personal ways of uh, looking at the material or personal experiences, because those are some of the uh, suggestions that uh, Gary and Austin had made for 102. Um, they've been trying to work on this for the longest time, but so many things have come up, the uh, important LNL work uh, for the past uh, oh, about eight or nine months uh, that they just haven't been able to get to. You know, we had a new website to uh, get going, get uh, upgraded and uh, do, you know, get the kinks out of. New hires, we hired two new people to help work at LNL Research. And then there's been a problem with our publisher of, our, of the books they had um, typos and uh, wrong words here and there that apparently there was a, a mechanical means of editing the new editions and then there were people that went back and tried to uh, look to see if all of those edits were correct and they just they missed hundreds of them oh, wow. and and so uh, they've had to work with that and try to get that uh, ironed out and that's taken such a long time so one thing and another has uh, made it difficult for them to uh, get back to editing 102, but now they're they're doing it, and the ball's rolling, and we're having a good time. And I always appreciate what they have to suggest as edits because uh, the whole idea is to make the book better. These are the two books that uh, uh, Carla made outlines for after she wrote *Living the Law of One* 101, *The Choice*, and she made outlines for 102, the uh, outer work, and 103, the inner work as well. So I got those outlines and I've written the first draft of both of them. So that's where they came from. If I remember right, well, and again, uh, heartfelt thanks to uh, Gary and Austin for, for helping with that work. I know they are <laughs> super busy. As oh, yeah. <laughs> but this is a really big deal. And it, I hope, I'm pretty sure I'm not the only one who's really looking forward to seeing those books when the, the time is right. Otherwise, I think I remember Ross saying something to the effect that uh, inner work relates to being and outer work relates more to functioning. I'm not totally sure if I understand that. Would you mind clarifying a little bit the meaning differences between inner well, work and outer work? I, I can give you my opinion of it. <laughs> and I may not be complete or right, but uh, I believe the inner work is what we're doing, what uh, Carla called and Quo called work in consciousness, where we're working on our own spiritual journey, which uh, works with uh, all of the energy centers and at some point uh, moves into the green ray where we have the opportunity to um, see everyone as the creator. And if we can get to that green ray level, then we are what Ra called harvestable to the fourth density of love and understanding. And in Carla's book, uh, the, uh, the Outer Work, she works with the lower energy centers, red, orange, and yellow that move into the green so that what work we do in consciousness to help us grow spiritually, then we can apply to the world around us and how we relate to people and to the culture around us, to the milieu that we live in, in the third density. And the, uh, the work then of the, the inner uh, work of the... Um, uh, 103 goes into the uh, blue, indigo, and violet ray chakras into how we can be more spiritually aware and advanced. This is the work of the adept. When you go beyond the green ray energy center that signals harvest into the fourth density, then Ra calls this the work of the adept, which is attempting to do uh, types of service and learning and being that may be able to be more effective in helping the creator to know itself better, which apparently is the whole reason for the creation. And these ways of helping the creator know itself better are also ways where the adept can help to know itself better as the creator. And there's a kind of a win-win situation there as the creator learns more through each adept's free will choices, the adept learns more about itself and the creator at the same time. So uh, our, our being, it's more of our, our, our work in uh, consciousness, our inner work, and how we reflect that being to those around us is the, the outer work of applying it to uh, the third density illusion. I see. Yes, yes, that makes perfect sense. Thank you. Thank you for explaining. May I ask if there are any new thoughts or insights or reflections that came to you in the process of looking at the book in this second round of writing 
Rebound. Well, uh, one thing that I've been trying to do more of, which Carlo is very good at, was sharing more personal experiences to uh, reveal how the principles apply in my own life as they did in Carla's life. So uh, remembering various experiences throughout my life, uh, uh, how I uh, you know, was uh, supported so much by my mom and dad, how they were just uh, wanting to do nothing but to help me to be happy. Uh, and uh, different ways that I expressed my own learning throughout uh, my life experience. So I've shared some of those experiences. And uh, I do think it helps because, you know, it, uh, it shows both the um, frailty of my own experience and the, the surety, uh, how uh, I'm just like anybody else that has to try to make sense of a life pattern. And at some point, you know, develops what's called the spiritual journey and become a seeker of truth and how this all came about and you know, what went into making it uh, the most important thing in my life. So uh, I think personal experiences are very helpful. Uh, I'm blessed to have some to share. Yes, I would most definitely agree with you on that one. I'm really looking forward to it. This would be your first books that you have written yourself? Yes. Yes. Wow. Yeah, that's a big deal. Yes, really looking for that. <laughs> that is for me. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and that's why we really appreciate your taking the time to, to be here on these Zoomcasts too. It's really nice to be able to connect with you face to face this way and hear some of your personal stories and sharing some together as a group. Um, and I am looking in the chat window and I see there's a number of folks who've been waiting very patiently to uh, ask you some questions. So without any further ado, uh, Linda, I see you have a question. Would you like to unmute your mic and ask? Hey, Jim, how are you doing? Linda, good to see you in What's that? Hi. See you both. Uh, my question kind of morphs into what you were just discussing in terms of personal sharing. I was going to ask if there, you've been with l l now for about 45 years. Do you have any seminal moment that you would like to let us know about that's happened during those 45 years that's of particular significance to you? Whoa, <laughs> let's see. What, what that's a deep one, huh? <laughs> um, hmm. Well, uh, of course, the raw contact has to be at the top of the list because uh, when I came to Kentucky to join Don and Carla back in uh, December of 1980, uh, we had no idea that such a thing was possible. We had uh, become good friends uh, the previous year as I was living in central Kentucky and had discovered that they uh, had these theories about UFOs. I heard a broadcast on WKQQ Lexington about uh, UFOs and the philosophy of UFOs and that we were all part of the one infinite creator. We were all here to make a journey back into unity with that creator. And uh, so if I finally got to meet them after about six months. I was you know, trying to figure out how to do that. And uh, I discovered that the, some of the folks in my food co-op uh, where we were ordering food to, uh, you know, we couldn't grow ourselves. Uh, were actually in Don and Carla's meditation group and they were happy to introduce me to them. So I went up there for a year, every Sunday night and attended their channeling meditations. And we became really good friends and they invited me to join them. Eventually I did. And three weeks later, the raw contact began. So after that, uh, everything was like um, just an amazing experience of being on the mountaintop with a view of the surrounding countryside that we had never imagined would be possible that whatever questions we could ask those of Ra, uh, they would be happy to answer as long as it didn't infringe on our free will. And uh, they were always very careful not to uh, do that. In fact, that's why they had the question and answer format because in the past there had been other confederation social memory complexes that had contact with entities on earth. And they gave what Brad Steiger called cosmic sermonettes. They just gave information out without uh, Actually, it turned out in the, in the end that they gave information out that might not have been that helpful uh, because some of it included information about nuclear power and so forth. So Ra decided the best way to observe our free wills to, to reserve the uh, 
format to questions and answers. So that was, uh, well, for me, the, the seminal experience of my life. It was a truly a mountaintop experience. And after the raw contact, of course, all the other channelings that have occurred have had information that's been most inspiring to me and I've been able to use in my own meditations. And I would guess then other types of information and inspiration that have come from my meditations where I've had inner guidance that has given me information that makes my meditations more uh, effective, you might say. Uh, meditation, uh, the definition that Ra gave it is the uh, listening to the creator. Uh, in prayer, we talk to the creator and in meditation, we listen to the creator in some fashion. It's not necessarily words. As Carla said, usually it's in thoughts or images that are too deep for words. Words just don't have the ability or to express some concepts and you have to have the experience of the words in some fashion. And I've been fortunate in, in various ways to receive inner guidance in that way that has been uh, invaluable on my own spiritual journey. So um, I would say that's the, the best of what I could give you. Uh, um, is there anything else uh, that I could say to your question? <laughs> I don't know if I've covered the ground. <laughs> that was perfect. Thank you very much for sharing. Well, thank you. It's good to see you both. Mm -hmm. That's a great question, Linda, as always. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, you know, it reminds me of when we were talking with uh, Gary and Austin just a week ago, we were talking about um, when, if and when entities, different entities agree and plan pre-incarnatively to meet in incarnation. What are the circumstances? How is it that circumstances are arranged that allow them to connect that way? And just thinking about how you met uh, the Don and Carla through the co-op, and wondering if your guidance system was helping you get to the place where you would hear what you needed to hear to connect with those folks and eventually connect that way. Uh, it's just yeah. only when I think only when you look back on your your life pattern. Can you see the steps you took that were appropriate to get you where you are now? Even though at the time, the step might have thought, you know, you might have thought, well, I don't know what to do here, but I'm going to go this way. Uh, and, and then you go that way and it, it's the way to go. But you don't know it for sure. Uh, although a lot of people do get some inner guidance. Uh, you know, Ross said we have guides that help us out along the path. And I certainly did uh, when I first moved to uh, the woods of central Kentucky. Uh, I had... Uh, just bought the land and I was in a tent with a friend of mine and she had a dog that was eating some dry dog food out of a metal bowl. And about, it was still in the dark, uh, very late at night. And it was enough to wake me into my pre-conscious. And all of a sudden I got this information that said, the key to your survival comes indirect through nervousness, Angelica. And I said, what? The key to your survival comes indirect through nervousness. I repeated it. And that was, uh, you know, I asked Ra about that. What does that mean? And they said, well, you know, there, there has to be some sort of angst or uh, worry in your particular situation. That's the indirect way that you will eventually do everything you came to do because you got a big job ahead of you. I knew I was going to have to build a log cabin and live in it off the grid, no water, no electricity, and be there. I didn't know how long, but I was there for six and a half years. So I knew all this work was ahead of me. And I, I was just worrying about it. And my worry was good enough to help me get the job done. But there was a more direct way. And I have a hunch over the years, the more direct way was to be simply have will, you know, the will to do it and the faith that all is well. It's going to turn out well. So don't worry about it. Just do it. You know, but it's always been my way throughout my life to worry something to death. You know, <laughs> you know, just sure you're worry not. about it, and then it doesn't happen. So I figure I worry it away, but I don't think it's the most efficient way. Yeah, I believe you were writing about that in yesterday's Camelot Journal entry, yeah. how the work is actually part of how you express that energy inside also. Right. Thank you. Hey, uh, I see Curtis has been waiting to ask a question for a long time. Thank you for your uh, patience, Curtis. Would you like to unmute your mic and ask? Good afternoon, Jim. How are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you, Chris? I'm doing great. My question is about the significator, potentiator, and the matrix. 
Can you uh, explain that to me a little bit more in like layman's terms, what that means? Okay, well, those three, uh, the matrix potentiator significator are the very first of the archetypical mind that was available to the third density at the beginning of this cycle of 75,000 years. Those were the carryovers, you might say, from the previous cycle, the, the octave of experience. So the matrix is basically the conscious mind and is called the magician because eventually, as the conscious mind is potentiated by the potentiator of the mind, which is the unconscious mind or the high priestess, then this potentiation of the conscious mind makes apparent some pre-incarnative choices that may be reflected in what is happening in your daily round of experience. The potentiator kind of gives a bias to the way you look at the world around you and how you interact, and what you learn from it, and what you give to it. So this then, if, if you're able to process this catalyst well enough, uh, before there was actually a catalyst of the mind or experience of the mind, then it went right to the significator which is your significant self that has existed throughout all your previous incarnations here on earth. And it is what you have learned of a helpful nature in the spiritual realm of discovering who you are and of being of service to others if you're polarizing positively. So the interaction between the conscious mind, the unconscious mind and the significator is really what makes our world, our inner world and our outer world go round. And Ra called the, the significator, no, get this right here, get the matrix, the conscious mind and the magician, because the magician has the ability to create changes in consciousness at will when it has been potentiated in a certain fashion by the unconscious mind. So the magic of the process is what we can do when we have contact with our subconscious mind and how we can learn from its biasing of how we see the world around us. And then we store that in our significant self, which becomes uh, our eternal self, uh, basically. Wow, okay, that's completely different from what I thought. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> well, thank you, I hope I helped you out, didn't confuse you. <laughs> no, it has me a lot, have a lot to think about on that. I have to okay. meditate on that one, but thank you. Uh, thank you. That was a great question, Curtis. Appreciate your asking. And I think uh, archetypes in the archetypical mind is something most people, even folks who've been studying the law of one for a while, still easily get, get lost in. Did you have any follow-up questions related to that or anything else related to archetypes or the tarot, Curtis? Sounds good. I uh, appreciate the question. And uh, I am looking chat window and it looks like Eileen had a question about meditation. Eileen, would you like to unmute your mic and ask? Yeah, I think it was at another, hi Jim, by the way, um, at another one of these question and answer sessions, you said you meditate six times a day. I was wondering why six times and how long each meditation usually takes. <laughs> um, the reason I meditate more these days is that when Carla passed away uh, seven years ago, I had a period of working with dreams for the next six or eight months that was very powerful. And I got a lot of very helpful information. And I, was, I just loved working with dreams. But at one point, somewhere around December of 2015, I got the inner message that the working with dreams was now over and it was time to meditate, to focus on meditation. So I started meditating uh, six times a day because that was the way my day was broken up. I, I get up about 3.15, my first meditation is about four in the morning. And that one is usually an hour to an hour and a half. And then I take an hour or two off and I do other work. I have breakfast. Uh, I used to take care of kitty cats. So I still have cats upstairs that a friend of mine left me when she passed away. So I still have cats to take care of. And other things Then my second meditation is usually about an hour or so long. Uh, my third meditation is right after lunch, and they get shorter then as the day goes on, uh, right after lunch, and then about uh, seven o'clock in the evening, and then the last one is nine o'clock, and those are about half an hour. And that just, uh, it seems like it, for some reason, it's easier for me to meditate longer 
earlier in the day, but the meditations are shorter, but better toward the end of the day. And by better, I mean, I'm able to keep the one pointed focus more easily and to feel like I'm in the presence of um, the creator or the father. So um, that's why I do what I do. <laughs> it's my own per personal path. I don't think that everybody has to do that, you know. <laughs> I think it's just curious. Yeah. That's a great question, Eileen. Did you have any follow-ups to that? No, not really. I just wanted to say I've been reading about your experience of the 10-day silent retreat. Uh, well, actually from Gary, not from you. Yeah, 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 yeah. He had quite a good but, Yeah, that experience. sounds amazing. That's something I would aspire to maybe like 10 years from now. It would take me probably to prepare for something like that. But that just sounded fantastic. Thank you, both of you, for sharing that with us. Yeah, um, Gary has his own... Uh, blog site i think it's uh spirit.com and you can go there and read about that experience he had there in those 10 days and then from time to time he's going to have other entries uh related to meditation and his personal life so that you can continue reading about how that meditation has affected him and continues to play a, a, a large role in his life a great journey to be sure Hey, may I ask when you're doing the hour long meditation, are all of your meditations silent meditations? Yes. And can you share with us a little bit more about how you do any of those meditations, either earlier in the day or later in the day, any particular process that might be helpful for students in meditation? Well, I don't know if it would be helpful for anybody else, but I've gotten in my own inner direction that suggests that uh, what you might call, or some people call square breathing, where you inhale and then you hold your breath and you exhale and you hold your breath uh, and then try to keep your focus on the third eye uh, is the way I try to do it. Uh, and I, I kind of use deep breathing as well. Uh, so that uh, there's um, not just uh, the normal breathing, but deep breathing as I inhale and then deep breathing out as I exhale. That's my style. Oh, and then you do the square breathing. Are you counting the amount of time between the inhale and the whole? No, it, it just kind of becomes uh, muscle memory after a while. Oh, fascinating. Yes, thank you for sharing that. Much appreciated. Uh, I see Lydia has a question that she wanted to ask about a movie that Don and Carla did. <laughs> Lydia, okay. would you like to unmute your mic and ask a question? Hello. Yes, I will. <laughs> Hello, Jim. Hello, so Lydia. I heard that Don and Carla did a movie and they made everything th themselves. Uh, and, and they made everything, pardon? They made everything, like the scenario, the, the decor, everything. Is that a real? Pretty much. That was way back um, when they first got together. And some of the messages that came through from the Confederation of Planets and the Service of the Infinite Creator suggested making a movie about the principles that they were sh channeling through Don and Carla might be a helpful way of sharing it with other people. So they made a movie. Uh, called the Hidan Malkyang Jiao, uh, or it was later sold uh, and became the Girl Snatchers, which is kind of a weird thing to think about. But the whole idea of the movie was, number one, to give them experience at making movies so that they would be able to make a, a better movie later. They were given $30,000 to make a movie about uh, sex and violence. <laughs> and so they thought, well, let's put this, you know, a funny spin on this. And then they made, they made this movie and Carla's brother was in it. I think uh, Morris's sister was in it. And uh, it, <laughs> I don't really think I can describe what all went on. Because it was just weird and wild and crazy and fun. And uh, they did, uh, however, you know, most movies that are made uh, don't ever see this. They don't make it to the screen. But uh, these movies did make it to the uh, drive-in movies uh, theaters in Southern uh, America, in the South. So they were successful in that regard. Um, but I, they didn't make any of the movies after that. They did learn a lot about movie making. 
And they had attempted to make another movie later on, uh, but as things go in movie making, uh, the, the rights to it were, were sold to somebody else and, and then they made a fiasco out of what was already done. And so nothing came of that. So uh, that's about it on the movie making, but it was a great experience. Wow, thank you. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you for the question, I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. That's a great question, Lydia. I did not even know that such a thing existed. Did you have any follow-up questions on that? Uh, I'm, I'm looking for the reference of the tarot that is using on the, on the book, and I don't know where to find it, to buy it. Uh, the yeah. reference, uh, the, 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 the deck of cards we used, is that what you're talking yeah. about? Yeah, the Egyptian one. Yeah, well, that is another story. Uh, we used uh, a deck, the Egyptian tarot, by C.C. Zane that was published in 1937 by the Church of Light in Los Angeles, California. Now, over time, apparently, the Church of Light has moved to Santa Fe, New Mexico, and in 2009, they published a new deck uh, called the, uh, what they, they renamed it, I forgot the name of the deck. They colored everything and they changed the images. So it's totally different. And you cannot get the original deck anywhere now. It is no longer in existence. And I can only guess that in the years from 19, uh, see, 1993, when we tried to get permission to use it until 2005 or 2009, there's been a change of uh, leadership or management and there's a new direction being taken because it, you can't get the old deck. It's just not possible. But you can go into uh, the uh, Raw Contact or book four of uh, The Law of One by Schiffer Publications and find the first three, the first seven cards of the mind in there because we redrew them. We took out the astrological uh, portions that Ross said were not appropriate because they did not mean to use it. It was not they that got those. It was the uh, Sumerians and the Chaldeans that asked for astro astrological information and combined it with what Ra had as the tarot. So Ra is trying to purify what they had. They don't have any problem with astrology. They just don't think it should be combined with the tarot. So um, you can find those that we had redrawn by a friend of ours in Atlanta and they don't have the astrological images. Wow, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Eileen. I appreciate your question. Mm -hmm. That's a great question, Claudia. Thank you for asking. I think, uh, yes, if you go to, uh, I was just looking at the LNL research website. If you click on the channeling link at the top the channeling tab, then click on the raw contact uh, from the drop down menu and then scroll down, you can see the images and information they have on the archetypes and the tarot. Uh, thank you again for asking the question. Uh, I saw that uh, Andre had a question also. Andre, would you like to unmute your mic and yes. ask? Sure. Hi. Hi, Jim. And uh, uh, there's actually several. Uh, well, one of the things is that, yeah, law of one.info slash images has the uh, full deck um, if, if, if you're interested, uh, Lydia. Um, and also, I was wondering if Jim uh, does any uh, other kinds of meditations other than the focusing kind, like say subconscious access meditation or a loving kindness meditation or, or any of the other many kinds of meditations? No, I don't. Uh, quick and simple answer there. <laughs> oh, okay. All right, and then I just had uh, the original question, uh, which is uh, so, so something that I heard from from I think Jonathan, who who reads your blog very much, and he, he noticed that you always are setting the law of one, uh, and um, I, I, as far as I know, I, I, you do not yet at least cite the Kuo and Latli, or any of the other confederation entities, and I was wondering why that might be, and if you might cite them in the future. Could you repeat the first part of your question? Why I read the law of one? Or? No, no, why you, you are not citing uh, the LL research archives uh, in your blogs. Uh, the other, other confederation context other than the uh, Camelot Journal. Uh, I think your um, 
writings are always about uh, entries from the raw contact. And I think he's asking, which was something I was wondering too, uh, if he would ever uh, analyze passages, sessions from Quo or Latwi or oh. other <laughs> sources. Am I getting your question correct, Andre? Is that what you're asking? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's, that's a good yeah. question. Yeah, because um, I, I really like the archives. Yeah. Um, when Carla first started the Camelot Journal back in 2005, um, she uh, was in England, Camelot, and she wanted people to have an idea about what she was doing there and how it went. And then when she got home, she decided to keep on writing the journal to let people know what a day in the life of LNL research was like. And then she lists some personal experiences. When Carla had her surgery on her back and was no longer able to do the Camelot Journal, I took it over and continued in the same fashion that she had. But then when she passed away, I decided as a tribute to her, I would look at the various books that she had either channeled or written over the years that uh, she was alive. And I began re reading uh, the, uh, the, the uh, Secrets of the UFO, a book of days that she channeled, a Wander's Handbook. And I commented on all of those and, and the others as well. And then it finally dawned on me, well, the only one you haven't done yet is the raw contact. And that was a large job because there were 2,600 questions and I wanted to cover each of them uh, as well as I could. So I went started on that project and I made it all the way through. And then toward the end of it, uh, it became obvious to me that just commenting on what Ra had to say wasn't as informative as what Ross actually said, so that I decided I would use quotes from Ra to explain and expand upon other information that Ra gave, because Don would ask questions, uh, sometimes in a slightly different way, to get further information to flesh out certain concepts. So I decided, well, I think that it would be helpful if I did the same thing, if I gave quotes from Ra to explain and expand on what Don has just asked and what Ra has just said, because then there is more information that helps it all to make sense. And I was doing that toward the end of the sessions when I finally got to the end, I thought, well, you know, I didn't do that with the first part. So uh, I went back and that's what I'm doing now. I'm finding all those places where I did not use uh, supporting quotes to expand the concepts. So right now I'm on session number 99 so I'm almost done with that. And maybe after that, I'll start thinking about Quo. But I do use Quo a great deal in both the uh, first uh, draft copies of 102 and 103. Uh, it's because uh, you know, Quo has a very uh, inspiring and poetic way of uh, putting things, whereas Ra is very informative, very specific, and very precise. Uh, Quo is uh, poetic, and a lot of people like Quo better, easier to understand. So um, I do respect Quo a great deal. Uh, we still channel Quo here in our channeling circle and uh, have been doing that since 1986. I think we have over 1600 sessions uh, on the website. So I, I will be referring to Quo in the future, uh, probably because I'm going to be done with uh, the raw contact here one day soon. So that's a good idea. I appreciate your help there. <laughs> Thank you for uh, asking Thank that you. question, Andre. Did you have any follow-ups on that or anything else? No, no that, that, that's all. Uh, other than uh, maybe consider uh, trying some other kinds of meditations. You're doing six a day anyways. <laughs> okay. <laughs> where could I discover? Uh, is there some place uh, online where you can discover the different types of meditation? Uh, well, uh, there's, there's many, many places. Uh, what I would... Um, I, I think that you, you may most benefit from uh, trying some theta wave meditations, um, which is subconscious access meditations. And if you just like Google that or, or, or search that. Okay. Then that, that's good. And also uh, for, for heart activation, loving kindness meditations. Okay. Well, they sound beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank you for sharing that, Andre. Uh, I see that Jessica has a question that she'd like to ask. Jessica, would you like to unmute your mic and ask? Hi, everyone. 
Um, so I wanted to ask Jim, throughout the material, you get the sense that Don is composing the book that he intends to write in his mind. <laughs> and I was wondering, did you ever have any sense of what that book was to be? And I was wondering if you could speak on the experience of coming to the conclusion that it was best to release the material as a transcript. The, uh, the last part was, it was a decision to release the material as a transcript rather than a book. I'm sorry, I didn't understand the last part of the question. I was wondering if you could speak to the experience of coming to the conclusion that it was best to release it as it is, as a transcript. Okay, okay. yeah. Um, we had the plan in the beginning, uh, as you can tell by just reading what Don had to say there, that he wanted to write a book. And he uh, was very much interested in everything Raw had to say about the law of one. Uh, so the book that finally came out, uh, right now we uh, have both our publisher's version, which is uh, the law of one, books one, two, three, four, and five. And then we have uh, new information that we got after a listing project was accomplished by Toby Wheelock, who has law1.info. He found 55 questions and answers that I somehow failed to transcribe. And I don't know how that worked, but it helped us to be able to have the right to publish this material uh, ourselves and called the Raw Contact of Volumes 1 and 2. So those are the books that came out of it. But Don also wanted to write a book himself. Um, and he, he got about uh, he got the introduction and the first chapter done, I think. And uh, it, uh, I don't even know if I remember the, the, the title of it. It's been so long since I've looked at that. Um, the Law of One uh, Living, let's see, The Law of One, All and Everything That You Need to Know to Graduate, or something like that. Uh, I quoted him, uh, one of the uh, quotes in my uh, 103 came from that unfinished manuscript. So uh, what little there was, was very well done, but he, he never was able to finish the book. Thank you. No, thank you for the question. Didn't even know about that. I am learning all sorts of great things today. <laughs> Jessica, did you have any follow-up questions to that or anything else? I did have a silly question. Um, oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> so in session 104, um, Don is asking about the cat Gandalf and he's, it says, um, Ross says, or no, Don says, um, or no, sorry, Ross says, firstly, we would like to suggest that the possibility probability vortices include those in which the entity known as Gandalf has a lengthier incarnation. Secondly, we would suggest that this entity goes to a graduation if it desires. Otherwise it may choose to reincarnate to be with those companions it has loved. Thirdly, the entity known to you as Betty has a means of making this entity more distorted towards comfort, discomfort. And then Don asks, well, who do you mean by Betty? And I never got the answer. So I was wondering if you could tell us who Betty is. <laughs> Betty was a friend of uh, the fellow that his wife passed away in November before the raw contact started. And he and she agreed that she would contact him through Carla after she passed on into larger life and give him information that would let him know she was okay. So that happened two different times. Those were the two first times Carla ever went into trance. And they were apparently uh, something that was very helpful for getting the raw contact started, that those trans experiences. So later on, Tom, who was the, the fellow whose uh, wife passed away, uh, got together with Betty. And I don't remember what her last name was, but she was uh, a veterinarian. And she knew different things that would be helpful to uh, Gandalf. So um, that was the Betty that was referred to there. But interestingly enough, um, when Ross said that uh, Gandalf might decide to come back and be with those it loved, we believe that's exactly what happened. Because uh, after he passed away, uh, about a year later, we got a cat. Uh, Gandalf was uh, a Siamese. And we got um, a lilac point Siamese after that that was mauve. We called her M-A-U-V-E, 
or Momo. And we were very sure that Momo was the reincarnation of Gandalf. So Gandalf uh, did come back. And uh, I have a hunch then after uh, Mo passed away that she's probably third density somewhere now. And uh, her, her grave, uh, I, I bury all the cats. Uh, Carl and I had 17 cats over 34 years and all of their grave sites are out in our pet cemetery. And uh, the one for Mo is uh, there and I label them all. So um, I'm sure uh, she is off having a good time, she or he, whatever, by now in some third density experience because Ross said that was a way that a lot of uh, cats or pets would uh, make the graduation through the, the love and devotion that is uh, created between the, the, the owner and the pet. And uh, I think that's the way it works. Thank you. I appreciate now knowing the rest of the story. <laughs> Thank you for your question. I appreciate that too. <laughs> what a beautiful story and what uh, great questions. Thank you, uh, Jessica. I see that uh, Siwen had a question that she wanted to ask. Would you like to unmute your mic and ask? Hi. Um, hi, Jim. I have a question. In session six, uh, in Ra's answer, he, um, he mentioned the, the exercise of the wind. I just wonder, do you know what, what is that exercise? Is it the same as the banishing ritual or is it some unpublished exercise he's referring to? Yes, there were some unpublished or uh, private material that Ra gave to us and asked us to keep it private for a while uh, so that uh, we could become more uh, efficient and um, able to be healers. At that time, we were hoping to uh, develop the healing process and, and use it uh, throughout our lives. As time went on, though, uh, we had more and more necessity to focus on other things toward the end of the raw contact. And both Don and Carla were having problems in just maintaining their uh, physical and mental uh, bodies. So we didn't go any further into that. Uh, there is a potential uh, time here when we have a resources guide ready to be published that we may uh, put that uh, material, which has not been published previously, in there so that people can see what both the exercise of the wind and the exercise of fire that are referred to uh, are and how they are used. But for the time being, um, we, we haven't done that yet. Did you have any follow-up questions to that, Sue Wynn? Um, yeah, I have another not quite related question. I also wonder during the uh, um, Carla's channeling of Ra, are all the words used in Carla's vocabulary or you guys have to look up for some of the words? <laughs> uh, we had to look up about 200 words that uh, Carla knew some of them because she had a very large vocabulary as did Dawn. But still, Ra had the choice of words that uh, we, we just didn't know what they meant. So uh, that was how the glossary got it got started. And um, later on, the, Gary and Austin talking about the glossary got off onto other tracks so that what came out of that was Gary's concept guide that was born from these questions, these uh, words that came up in the questions and answers in the raw contact. So uh, at one point, I think Don did ask Ra if they used uh, Carlos vocabulary or if they used the vocabulary of the English language. And they said, well, in many cases, the, it, you know, the instrument, uh, the vocabulary is sufficient, but we use the, uh, the uh, English language. And Don asked, well, do you have the uh, knowledge of all the languages on earth? And Ross said, no, <laughs> a simple no. <laughs> that is fascinating. Did you have any follow-up questions on that, Suwen? No, that's that's very interesting to know. So for certain words, does, does Carla had to spell it out or she just say it, then you have to just look it up based on her pronunciation? Um, Carla was not in her body when she channeled Ra. And Ra was not in her body either. Uh, Ra used her body, uh, you might say from a distance, from the inner planes of earth, to make words. They used her mouth and her tongue and her lips to make the words. 
And uh, if you ever have had a chance to listen to the raw contact, uh, every word and syllable was enunciated very clearly and very slowly so that you had no problem hearing the word. But what I was always amazed at was how Don could listen to this very slow uh, enunciation of words and syllables and make sense out of the response and ask another intelligent question. Because I was, when I was transcribing it, I was just blown away about how, how that could happen. Because I don't know if you've been to our website, um, there is a project that uh, Trisha Bean has been accomplishing. She's almost done with it now. She's coordinated the, the words that you can see on the screen with the words you hear Carla channeling so that you can look at the screen and hear her too saying the same thing and it it's just amazing it's just uh, very inspiring they uh, as they said they delivered the words at a set pace given because they were operating using carla's uh, vital energy the energy of the mind the body and the spirit used in the spiritual sense and using that energy in a pulse in a pulsing way so that it was evenly given given out just, just like that and um, it's amazing. I, 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 and I think you really enjoy uh, listening and watching the rock contact. That is wow. fascinating. Did yeah. you have uh, more follow ups, Sue Wen? No, thank you. That's well, thank you, Sue Wen. Very interesting. Thank you, Jim. That is so fascinating. I never knew that. All I know is there's many times I've had to look up words online. <laughs> they were. And yeah. So you're saying that Ra would actually use words that were not part of Carla's vocabulary either, that they yeah. somehow knew because they know enough of the English language? Am I right? Right. right. She, she had a great vocabulary and she knew some of those that I didn't know. <laughs> And uh, Don had an even better vocabulary, so, uh, but still Ra had the best. <laughs> well, that's interesting then that they would know that much of the English language, but not know other uh, world languages. I would have yeah. thought that they could conceivably communicate in any language. Yeah, you would think that because they could do so many amazing things, but there are some things they just could not do, you know, um, like this, this drone that was, uh, detonated over the Tunguska region in Russia in uh, 1908, I think. Don asked Rob about that. And it was a drone that was sent here to keep track, the Confederation sent it here, in order to keep track of the scientific advances that were being made on Earth at that time. So they needed a drone to tell them that, which, number one, is kind of odd. And number two, the drone malfunctioned. So they had to take it to someplace remote and detonate it so that it would not cause any problem in you know uh, a town or a city or anything and why couldn't they pick it up out of the air and take it uh, who knows we never asked you know there's very likely a good reason there was always a good reason whenever we asked them a question but we never asked never thought about it you know until later like, why didn't they do that how did they not know that you know <laughs> who knows that is fascinating yeah do you think it's possible that they would have more command of other world languages if they in fact channeled through entities who people who spoke those languages is it because would, entities they've channeled through are mainly english speakers i would think that would be possible but that's just my opinion i don't really know i mean when they walked among the egyptians i assume they knew how to speak egyptian or whatever the dialect was at that time yeah yeah wow mm. Fascinating. So when uh, during the conscious channeling processes then of Kuo or other confederation entities, does it happen? Well, it clearly happens often then that they are also using words that the channeler isn't necessarily familiar with, but just have to say the sounds that seem to be coming to them? Uh, to my knowledge, that doesn't really happen. Uh, in the conscious channeling, it really is necessary to, to know the words okay? because it's, it's a different process. Uh, it's actually you there. And uh, I don't think it's ever happened that somebody has, has given a word they didn't know. If anybody would have, it would be Carla, but to my knowledge, she didn't either. <laughs> you know? 
Yeah, that's fascinating because no, there's there's still quite a few words I've seen in the quote channeling that I've had to look up to. And uh, yeah, yeah, I don't think they were on the SATs either, so. <laughs> <laughs> as far as I can remember. Yeah. Hey, uh, I am looking at my clock and it's looking like we are about at the end of our hour. I did want to ask any of the folks on the Zoom call if they had any questions that they've been kind of holding on to and waiting to ask. This would be a good time to ask if you'd like. Uh, otherwise, um, and I'll keep an eye on the chat window if there's something that you want to ask. Uh, Jim, did you have any? Uh, Andre, did you have a hand up? Did you have a question you wanted to ask? Oh, I, I just, just wanted to just to follow up on, on what Jim was saying. It, it just it's like I know sometimes when I speak of spiritual entity, I also get words I'm not familiar with when I have to look them up. And uh, so that's just interesting. <laughs> yeah, appreciate you sharing that. Okay. And uh, Marcella, did you have a question you wanted to ask? Hi, yes. <laughs> How are you? Um, I just have a, a question about intuition. During the channelings and even now, um, did you feel as a group like a general intuition or a single intuition towards uh, anything and sort of like an inner guidance uh, towards this work? Are you asking now, did you feel uh, the use of intuition helped us in the raw content? Yes. Um, I would say that intuition helped us to formulate questions that might produce uh, more helpful information. And that was more a facet of what Don had to offer. Um, many times before we actually had the contact, just before we'd have a meditation together in the living room, and Don would get uh, another question or two, or sometimes three, that would be, uh, he would intuit them. And then when we went into the session, we would ask that, those questions, and they would produce some very interesting information and, and take us on a track in a different direction than we had originally planned, because the night before, we would always sit together and try to formulate questions uh, regarding the what to ask when we would consider the previous session, what information we got, then we formulate more questions. But then again, like I said, Don would get some others to ask and take us on another track. So that was, I think Don's intuition was probably that played the largest role in the contact. Uh, his intuition and his intelligence and his experience uh, in the paranormal and investigating UFOs uh, for 25 years before the raw contact, I think all of those three items together really made him able to conduct this conversation with Ra. It was 2,600 questions long, and uh, his questions were always most uh, illuminating in themselves. And uh, then Ra would uh, further uh, shine the light on uh, the answer. Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, that's a great question. Do you have any follow-up questions on that, Marcella? Thank you. No, no, thank you. Not for now. <laughs> thank you, Marcella. Yes, I believe we've heard from a number of confederation entities who have said that oftentimes the questions are more important than the answers. So appreciate everything that's been said today. Uh, Jim, did you have any thoughts or last thoughts, reflections wanted to share with us uh, before we wrap up for today? Well, I've always enjoyed our conversations and today I think was an especially uh, inspiring and uh, informational. Uh, you guys had a lot of good stuff to offer me and hopefully I gave you some back and, you know, that's the way we all learn back and forth with information, questions and answers and, you know, maybe one day uh, I'll get to sit here and ask you all questions. <laughs> yes, if you have any questions about memes or pop culture, we're <laughs> all over it, my friend. <laughs> Otherwise, uh, thank you so much for being here. Our uh, hearts, our love and light go to all our friends and family uh, in Eastern Kentucky as well. And uh, appreciate your uh, taking time to be with us. Much love to you and thanks to you and to all our friends at uh, LNL Research for all they do in service to others. 
thank you for everyone who's uh, joined us on this uh, Zoomcast today. Your presence here is much appreciated and much thanks and love and gratitude to all who are watching this on YouTube at some other space time and time space. Until next time, in love and light of the one infinite creator. Happy Namaste. Thank love you. you all. I'll be well.